The keen-eyed among you will know that I opened my Yak as a Kiwami 2 review with the statement that Toshihiro Nagoshi's team at Sega is known more for iterating on formula than making sweeping alterations to it, but it would seem that all is about to change with their upcoming release Judgment, following Kiryu's swan song in Yakuza 6, where he beat people up on the mean streets of Kamurocho, falling deeper and deeper into an ever-winding national conspiracy. Now we have an all-new IP in which disgraced lawyer turned hard-boiled detective Yagami beats people up on the mean streets of Kamurocho as he digs deeper and deeper into an ever-winding national conspiracy. Oh, and I guess it's also Ace Attorney now. Of course, if you had any interest in the game and saw the trailers, you'd likely already knew this to be the case, but make no mistake, Judgment is a Yakuza game through and through. The calligraphy-esque aesthetic of prior Yakuza titles may have been replaced by something sleeker, more akin to a crime procedural, but this look is still being used in the same ways. It still sees the game's lengthy, labyrinthine story broken up into multiple chapters. It still introduces us to new characters through dramatic freeze frames alerting us to their name and profession. Besides a fresh cast of characters then, and an eye towards incorporating more detective-like mechanics, Judgment takes what came before and iterates on it yet again. Perhaps a disappointing turn of events for those hoping for the team to break out and try something radically different, but honestly, what becomes clear over the 40 or so hours it'll take you to roll credits is that when it comes to that formula and the story being told, and despite the new detective systems frequently falling a little flat, Judgment often feels like Nagoshi's team at the top of its game. And there was a moment where this all clicked for me, where in between the grim, gargantuan nature of the main narrative's murder mystery and the downright intimidating amount of side activities to explore, I decided I needed to pause, have a smoke, get absolutely blitzed off a bottle of whiskey I bought at the store, and drunkenly kickstart a martial arts ebook for way more money than was reasonable. And at that point I thought, what other game would possibly allow me to do this? See, while the team has been making this same type of game for a long time, it's worth noting that, well, no one else has been. No one else has been creating these utterly unique open worlds that fall somewhere in the middle of Rockstar's violent chaos and a game like Shenmue's menial labour and literal clock watching. Judgment captures a kind of heightened mundanity super well, allowing you to self-express in a way that, beyond the whole stomping on faces thing, bears some striking resemblances to real life. I mean, I'm sure many of us have spent money on things we maybe shouldn't have when drunk. It's mischievous, consistent with Yagami's character, rather than outwardly violently chaotic. And as much as these games are known for lengthy cutscenes filled with screeds of text for you to read through, what Judgment shows is the team's almost unparalleled ability to convey character through mechanics most other games would see as insignificant. For example, every element in that chain of events I described earlier carries a mechanical benefit as well as being thematically relevant. The whiskey I bought wasn't just to move around all wacky like, the smoke break wasn't solely in service of the brief stories you overhear from other people in the room, these features have real gameplay and implications. Namely, smoking increases your EX or heat gauge, while drinking increases the speed at which that same gauge will fill up during fights. In other words, and contrary to what decades of anti-smoking ads or warnings about the dangers of alcohol have taught me, getting loaded up on booze and smoking loads of cigarettes makes you an unquestionably better fighter here, allowing you to pull off the wild moves at Yagami's disposal, hell, maybe the ones you learned from that martial arts ebook you drunkenly pledged for, at a much faster clip. Moreover, eating recovers health, but crucially sobers you up, meaning I found myself at multiple points planning my route so I could keep my health up without actually having to eat any food so I'd be better prepared for random encounters which, despite the options available to me in terms of reintroduced combat styles, could see a pylon from just a few enemies absolutely obliterate my HP if I wasn't careful. That is to say, the need to maintain my buzz governed my exploration of this map to a strange degree. My daft impulse to get Yagami drunk ended up revealing a key part of his character purely through gameplay. Namely, that he's a very different person to Kiryu, going from fish-out-of-water gangster to, in many ways, the archetypical hard-boiled detective with a premise and approach that isn't too dissimilar to that of characters like Matt Scudder or Philip Marlowe. And as you spend time with Yagami, you see the unwavering sense of moral duty I so loved about Kiryu, replaced by an understandable but less heroic desire to get paid. 
Kiryu's charming bashfulness supplanted by Yagami's often surly demeanour. You won't see Yagami dancing around in a karaoke booth like Kiryu, for example. As his penchant for drone racing and unnecessary jacket belt buckles attest to, he's too cool for that man. Further, his relationship to the world of organised crime is complicated. He may bash people's teeth in just as forcefully as Kiryu, but he's an upstanding, law-abiding type that won't mess around with guns or blades, those are illegal. No, instead he favours good old-fashioned blunt force trauma while liquored up to keep the peace. And while it may seem impossible at first to root for this edgy gamer detective over the hooligan with the heart of gold, well, Yakami's writing is honestly just that good a lot of the time. All of his bluster belies the fact that he's trying to find his place in the weeds of the Japanese legal system, haunted by his past and racked with guilt over his previous actions as a lawyer, trying to reconcile the notion that a lawyer's job to win a trial and a detective's job to uncover the truth can be two very different things. His dogged determination to get to the bottom of the case trumps almost everything else, especially his own well-being. And so what better way to get across this inner turmoil to convey the noir vibe of proceedings here than mechanically incentivizing our character to engage in what are otherwise unhealthy, self-destructive habits? These games feature you slamming people's faces into the ground with cool martial arts and also bikes. To suddenly shift to something wholly self-serious just wouldn't make sense. So instead, why not say, you know, these prohibition era detectives we're drawing from sure do rely on alcohol to an unhealthy degree. Let's make that the key to being good at fighting here. And it might sound like I'm making a big deal out of nothing, but little gameplay details like this mean that the team can maintain the more sombre tone of hard-boiled fiction while also playing it out against the backdrop of some of the most entertaining sub-stories seen since Yakuza 0, where you might chase a wig that's flown off a popular celebrity's head for example. It continues the creator's pretty masterful understanding of tone and how to convey it as only they can, stripping a genre framework down to its essentials and figuring out how to effectively represent that in an entirely different medium and style where you'd think it wouldn't fit. What are less effectively implemented then are the more literal representations of detective work, coming in the form of tailing missions, visual profiling, finding and presenting evidence in the like. These are all things detectives do, sure, but instead of punctuating an otherwise typical Yakuza game with interesting new gameplay features, your adventures are rather interrupted by discrete chase sequences that see actions you'd normally perform automatically in the open world now attached to random quick time events for some reason. Multiple sequences see you walk slowly behind someone then press circle when they predictably turn around, with some instances lasting as long as 5-10 to 10 minutes, and suffering from strange technical problems when you go even a little off script. First person sequences will have you wondering why the game had to slow everything down so you could do something as simple as turning on a light. And even with the game going full blown ace attorney in the presenting of evidence, none of it is challenging or involved enough to read as anything other than a gimmick. Every part of the game's detective framework is too rudimentary and janky to do anything other than kill the story's pace. And for all the progress the team had made in Yakuza 6 and Koami 2 in removing the seams between exploration and combat, creating something more immersive, it seems strange to build up all those walls between systems once more. And it's all the more disappointing considering that they kind of already solved the problem of more organically encouraging detective-like thinking in players. The answer's simple, remove the objective marker. A few missions here do that, and in a series that usually points you in exactly the direction you need to go, a more vague objective will pop up such as check in with Kaito, without any indication of where you're actually meant to do that, requiring you to trawl through case files and evidence and line it up with street names to find out who they might be with and where that person usually hangs out. It's simple stuff but had me feeling way more like an actual detective than any of the systems explicitly shoved in my face to do so, leading me to hope that this is the kind of approach the team grabs gravitates towards in future installments. And that's the weird thing about all of this, this game was supposed to be a breakaway from previous titles in the Yakuza framework, I was excited for that. And yet, it's arguably when judgement is at its most Yakuza, that it's at its most enjoyable. And I get that this sounds the same as someone telling a band, you know, just play the hits, but I promise it's more than that. Don't get me wrong here, I adored Judgment despite its imperfections, I feel like that's part and parcel with any Yakuza game. But that's also kind of the point, bolting on features from other games only sticks out because the Yakuza formula is still so uniquely its own thing, and when making just slight changes to that formula can so effectively convey wildly different character traits when it allows for writing this good, it makes me think that quote unquote innovation for the sake of it means very little when what you already have continues to be so innovative in itself. 
So I hope you enjoyed my review of Judgment. If you did and would like to support my work directly, you can always head to my Patreon like these wonderful folks currently on screen. Your support is absolutely what allows me to put in the time necessary to make these videos and I cannot thank you enough for that. Special thanks go to Mark B. Writing, Rob, Nico Blakely, C. Vass, Artyom Vitsuk, David Bjork, Lucas, Hebe Amore, Dallas Keane, William Fielder, my dad, Ali Aluhana, Timothy Jones, The Nameless Guy, Chris Wright, Ham Migas, Zach Casserly, Samuel Pickens, Shardfire, Anna Pimentel, Jesse Ryan, Brandon Robinson, Justin Holderness, Matthew Natchery, Nicholas Ross, and Charlie Yen. And with that, this has been another episode of Writing on Games. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.